Well, I hail she is goody corer and gaitel she is to firkin office serum, then she live tronona gus come weakest live a certain curriculum. That's in that ancient language that uh, I think we, we were talking about earlier. May I say, excellencies and dear friends, I sh feel almost inclined to say all protocols observed, given the significant number of dignitaries that are gathered here. Very dear friend of mine, indeed, somebody whom I've known for over 40 years is Kevin Cahill, I just say. Kevin, from the very beginning of my many adventures in Central and Latin America, is somebody that I'm so pleased, and I thank him for being with me to, for being with me this morning. <laughs> I want to say too, as well, that the flag is at a half mast. I think in your university, and that is a very, very fine gesture. I think to NYPD officer Brian Mulkeen. Uh, who has just uh, has his life taken away. I think that's important. I should say also that this is not my first uh, Jesuit university. I've been at uh, other Jesuit universities, but one in particular that has always been very close uh, to my own heart is at Oka. Uh, I visited it's in the 1980s with my late friend Sally O'Neill Sanchez. We, we visited uh, Salvador, and I think I was driven around, if you like, on the first f f fact gathering mission in Derechos Humanos by uh, uh, Padre El Curia. And I knew the, the Jesuits who, who were murdered in, 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 in El Salvador, their housekeeper, her daughter. And when I visited again as president, I visited there, where in the point at where, in fact, they were shot. Also, then, in discussing that, I discussed with, if you like, uh, Oscar Romero, and how, if you like, the, the, the murder of his fellow priest in a neighboring parish, Padre Rodillo, had led to uh, his change in conscience. And I had the great pleasure in my last visit of meeting distinguished John Sobrino. So, these are all connections I have had uh, with the Jesuits and their universities. But I think my first encounter with them was actually a very angry encounter with the then ambassador from a very large country in North America, in San Salvador City, who pulled out a map and said to me, and to the ne ambassador Negro Ponte, and he said to, to, to Sally O'Neill and I, he said, this, he said, is the problem, he said. It starts, he said, with literacy. And after that comes cooperatives. And then you get communism. And everywhere there are the Jesuits. <laughs> now, that was actually when I think Patrick uh, Elicoria was driving me uh, in, in El Salvador. And I felt it as a great... Uh, personal loss, as ought was great loss to all of us uh, with what happened, those wonderful people who were giving their lives to emancipation. To, to make a beginning on, on, to this lecture, what I have entitled Humanitarianism and the Public Intellectual in Time of Crisis. I very much always enjoy returning to an academic environment and this is perhaps understandable, having been a university teacher for so much of my life. It was a world that I found profoundly rewarding and enriching. But there is no place quite like a university for reflection, the hallowed seat of learning, yes, but far more important, a gathering place of the young and curious who believe that the world need not be as cruel as it is, but indeed can be changed. Universities can transform people's lives through education and, of course, through the wider impact of their research. And universities, too, can help students to develop their skills and knowledge. And now, perhaps this is the most important of all. I think now, given our interacting crises, ecological, economic, social, and may I suggest ethical, we turn to universities in near desperation 
to provide a basis to help us for a broader understanding of the interconnectedness of our social ecological system. University research, it is claimed correctly, is potentially of benefit uh, to everyone, with the capacity of intellectual space, of enriching society and stimulating culture, and of course, while also creating enterprise. However, now it must face its greatest challenge. A moment of truth has arrived for all institutions, including third level institutions, that of facilitating an exit from a paradigm that has failed humanity and of outlining how we can make our way to a new paradigm that will lead to integrated, sustained eco-social policies of sufficiency and equity. It will no longer be sufficient to train people to look after, to run after the bus of disaster, but to seek to understand why it is all happening. For what we teach, after all, is the foundation of policy, and subverting the taken for granted, the authoritarian and the socially dangerous must be the core values of a university. Indeed, I agree with Father Machine, John Hughes, Archbishop of New York, who established this very university, St. John's College, in 1841, understood instinctively that education is key to active and enriching citizenship for immigrants and to human flourishing. The story of John Hughes' family is a quintessential Irish-American story, a family who departed Ireland's shores two centuries ago, families some of whom were forced to leave as a result of hunger or persecution, while others earlier in the 19th century had sought to escape poverty and to build better lives for themselves and their families. Throughout its history, Fordham, itself as an education institution, has had a commitment to the betterment of society and social justice, both at home and abroad. In relation to those two waves of migration, it is very important as well that that first migration from which, if you like, John Hughes came, they are from South Ulster, North Munster, in many cases, they paid their fare to come after the revolution of 1798 and the U Act of Union of 1800. There was a rumour that the country was finished. Many people who had the means of anything just simply moved and they came early. They established themselves early and so on. They would be completely different to the tsunami of the desperate who would come in the 1850s. In America and elsewhere across the globe, the Irish found refuge and opportunity. They did not escape either the marginalisation or the exploited fear of the other that is the experience now of too many migrants today. They overcame this and went on to contribute to the economic, social, political and cultural development of their adoptive homes, as today's migrants are doing all over the world. Here in the United States, we saw a new Irish-American culture emerge as a result of the mingling of these different strands, as it were, of two rich cultures interacting, creating something that is not reducible to either, but which in its transcendence combines the best of both heritages. Today, 17% of Irish citizens are currently living abroad joining a continuous trend within the 70 million people of Irish descent worldwide. The Irish were not easily either to forget, and it is something, and it, Father Machine mentions, what we must never forget. We too, in fact, were editorialised in the 1840s, suggesting, for example, that the Irish famine was an act of God, that the Irish, in fact, were being punished as well as that other sometimes as well, that they were backward, a hopeless case. And indeed, a brilliant philosopher some 100 years earlier had said they had never even been occupied by the Romans, so how could they have the civilities that other people had? But I think, therefore, they didn't convert. These editorials of the 1840s, a mere 12 years later, in 1860, you will find, I think, in the Times of London, a different editorial appears. And it says, if it goes on like this, as it is likely to go on, the United States will become very Irish. 
So in Ireland, there will still be, but on a a colossal scale and in a new world, we shall have only pushed the Celt westwards. Then no longer cooped between the Liffey and the Shannon, he will spread from New York to San Francisco and keep up the ancient feud at an unforeseen advantage. We must gird our lines to encounter the nemesis, the nemesis of seven centuries' misgovernment. To the end of time, a hundred million spread over the largest habitable area in the world and confronting us everywhere by sea and land, will remember that their forefathers paid tithe to the Protestant clergy, rent to the absentee landlords, and a forced obedience to the laws which these had made. And thus it was to be in a way, but there is of course a great challenge in that, one with which I have been engaged as president for the first period of my presidency. That is, how do you make an ethical commemoration, different commemoration, how do you use memory ethically, which is for a whole other day, and anyway, it's all on my website, so there it is. (laughs) But I think that this question of, in fact, actually, putting the narrative of the other into one's consciousness in such a way that one is able to reread. And who knows, as I said in one of my poems, who knows come to a point where forgiveness might be possible. Our nation's history contains many tragic reminders of the desperate plight of those forced to flee their country. As I've been speaking of it, the most acute, which of course is that great famine of of the 1840s, One million people died from starvation, further 2.5 million emigrated, the majority to North America, resulting in the halving of the population on the island of Ireland between 1841 and the early 1900s. It is important to remember that in the census of 1901, of all of the people born on the island of Ireland, a majority were living outside Ireland. And I think that is, gives you, I think, an idea. So the collective memory of the famine and of people forced to flee their homes is something which I think must always re- resonate profoundly in Irish society. As a country, we have known what it is to be hungry and to be forced to flee our homes. It isn't only that, because new research is showing, particularly the excellent work at University College Cork on the famine, great book of the famine, but not so the new research, is many people died on their way to the many people died on their way to the port. And to actually pay the fare of three pounds ten to come to North America to come to the Canada or five pounds to go to an American port required that you had something to sell. A cow, perhaps, or perhaps or the last implements or whatever. But many died, and it is the reason why there is a gap in the figures. Again, in relation to others, where we have details of where people died, but not where they were baptised, it is because they died on the way, and and so forth. I think that this memory of our our past has shaped and continues to shape our values and sensibilities today, instilling in us a moral calling to help others in need. I interject here to say this is not easy, because there is often a contradiction between the ethical implementation of that identification with human need and another kind of individualistic impulse to want to be among the smartest very often and to be, if you like, the most successful in a highly individualised version of economy and society at point to which I'll come. They are not necessarily contradictory, but they pose a moral dilemma and they impose choices at times. I think today millions of people around the world, of course, face the same fear, suffering and desperation as before, in increasing numbers and in worse circumstances. And I want to suggest that the current status being accorded to asylum seekers in administrative systems and in the media discourse urgently calls into question political philosophies and test the principles according to which our contemporary liberal democracies have been drawing the line between, for example, the rights of citizens and those of prospective citizens. After all, I'm in a university with a distinguished law school. This is an argument I remember, which we have had in Ireland, of course. We've become accustomed to narratives 
of how men and women throughout the world as refugees find themselves for extended periods of time in unsuitable accommodation, confined to forced idleness without even control over their daily diet. So then, as Eugene Quinn, director of the Jesuit Refugee Service in Ireland, remarked, children grow up, quote, without the memory of their parents cooking a family meal. I know things are being attempted at improvement, but I read Eugene only, I read Eugene Quinn's remarks with familiarity as having seen it happen in too many places in the world. The migrant experience is a journey of special vulnerability imposed on top of existing vulnerabilities. I am minded to recall the reflections of Hannah Arendt in her 1943 essay, We Refugees, and later expanded upon in her seminal book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. I think those reflections of Anna Arendt have lost none of their accuracy or potency. I think if I had a word that I wanted to see as a major and minor success out of the different papers I've been giving recently, it is of suggesting, I think, the difference that there is when people use words like internationalism, interdependency, the dominant time people will say to you as people meet precedents, and including myself, that we're talking about trade. But really, wouldn't it be such a different place if people opened the conversation with people about the internet, the whole question of interdependent vulnerabilities, where you opened the conversation on vulnerability, on as indeed that fine work of Ian Goff and others, it, which in his book, Heat, Greed and Human Need, if it opened on human need and then it went on to structures. But the notion about it is, is in fact, that it nearly always begins with trade. And I'll come later to suggest, I have no hesitation in saying it, this has devalued everything, really, in relation to intellectual life, and it has devalued diplomacy very seriously. Arendt had described the fate of refugees as that of human beings, who, unprotected by any specific political convention, suffer from the plight of being unrecognized by the state. In a couple of weeks' time, I will visit, see this in action in places like, in places like uh, Lebanon. She identifies that deadlock that arises from the entanglement between the rights of humans and those of the citizen in the nation-state. The so-called inalienable rights of man, which is there in the rhetoric, cease to be protected as soon as they are decoupled from the rights of the citizens of a state, leading to this tragic paradox that the refugee, as the one empirically the most vulnerable, who should have embodied the rights of humans par excellence, represents instead the object that constitutes the radical crisis of this concept. The group who came to be with, I think, in relation to this, people think, you see, that I, I would ever be thrown by getting the step ages to go, not at all. When you're at it for years, you know. Her, I want to say about Arendt. Arendt has intrigued me because I have used her work quite such a lot in recent years in relation to memory and forgiveness. But she herself, a refugee from Germany, who went through an internment camp to France before be seeking asylum in the United States, Arendt had a profound understanding of how the loss of citizenship was akin to the loss of human status. For not only do refugees lose their homes, that is, the entire social structure into which they were born and in which they established for themselves a distinct place in the world, they also lose the political framework in which they had the right to have rights. Indeed, refugees and asylum seekers, in some instances, have been allowed or sustained in terms of both life and liberty, but yet they are deprived of the context in which their actions, their opinions, their ability to participate in speech and thus in politics have meaning. For Arendt, therefore, to be stripped of citizenship is to be stripped of words. 
to fall to a state of utter vulnerability with avenues of participation closed off and thus new futures disallowed. It is for this reason that I believe it is my responsibility as President of Ireland to encourage us Irish at home and abroad to be exemplary in reaching out to those who find themselves seeking shelter and succour on our shores. In June, Sabina and I had the opportunity of welcoming refugees and asylum seekers, as well as those on the front line working with them to Oris and Uktron. The group who came to be with us that day included families who had arrived in Ireland at different times over the past 40 years, from Iran, Sudan, Syria and Vietnam. Each of them had made enormous sacrifices, leaving family behind, taking risks to leave their homeland in order to create new and better lives that have undoubtedly resulted in making valuable contributions to our modern and inclusive society. They have brought to us a rich story and experience to add to ours, and that should never be forgotten. I propose to ask you how often as you read and hear about it. Why is it that all this migratory activity on a migratory planet is always described as the problem of migration? The problem? What about the 10 to 12% of GDP globally produced by migrants? Why do you use language, the problem of, and so on? Many of it, I think, as well, of that day, I think that many of those families to which I've made reference, that Sabine and I have had the opportunity to meet with and visit in recent times, are refugees and asylum speakers moving through Ireland's refugee and asylum system, which is grounded, of course, in the 1951 Refugee Convention and in its 1967 protocol. It is worth recalling the background to this international legal framework. If we consider the aftermath of World War II as having launched the first truly global refugee crisis in contemporary times, so too did this period and these events elicit an equally global response. Recognizing the urgent need to help millions of Europeans who had fled or lost their homes, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, was established in 1950 with a three-year mandate. I think this is very much well borne in mind what stood behind that decision. Today, that organization continues to work hard to protect and assist refugees around the world. Underpinning its work is the 1951 Refugee Convention, which defines the term refugee and outlines the rights of the displaced, as well as the legal obligations of states to protect them. And Ireland is one of the 145 states to have ratified the convention and several regional responses have since yielded further declarations regarding asylum. Now, 70 years after the mass displacement of what was the Second World War, forced displacement and migration are again at record levels. In June of this year, the United Nations Refugee Agency produced the shocking statistic that the number of people fleeing war, persecution and conflict had exceeded 70 million globally last year, as you have heard, the highest number in the UNHCR's history, 2.3 million more than the previous year, highlighting the growing scale of the, college, of the challenge. The vast majority are displaced within their own countries, however. Almost 26 million people crossed international borders in search of international protection in 2018. But isn't it important to just question the scholarship that refuses to look at the structure of the sources of those migratory movements? We can have the academic thing to a point and what is voluntary, involuntary, and so on. I spent a great deal of my life at that. Furthermore, looking at the current geopolitical landscape, it is hard to imagine a situation in which the number of people in need of international protection will decline in the short term. Conflict and instability is now the single biggest driver of refugee flows, and conflict zones are producing the largest proportion of deep endemic global poverty. 
The war in Syria alone has resulted in over 6.7 million refugees in the region, while another 6.2 million people are displaced within Syria. Bangladesh continues to host almost 1 million Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. Over 300,000 people have fled insecurity and violence in Central America. 4 million people have fled Venezuela since 2014. And in the majority of cases, I say it slowly, in the majority of cases, Neighbouring countries have opened their borders to those fleeing, demonstrating compassion and empathy to the new arrivals. What is our obligation then to those who do that? It is a very serious one. There are, however, new challenges that are forcing people from their homes. Part of the growing challenge is linked to a changing climate. Dangerous shifts in climate are placing stress on communities where ecosystems can no longer support populations, leading to a lack of resources and contributing to conflict and violence. The anthropology of Africa will show you the people moving in many cases, creating huge new conflicts in relation to pasture and in relation to access to water. And unless we collectively take action to prevent catastrophic climate change, as well as assist communities to prepare for and adapt to changing climates, these population flows driven by climate shifts are only going to increase. They are increasing. A lack of development, failures of governance, and increasing inequality within and between countries are also fueling instability and conflict. This is a deepening, if you like, of what I call the intersecting crisis of ecology, economy, and society. And these points have been made so well in Terralia by Pope Francis himself in Laudato Si. Worryingly today, the welcome and support shown to European refugees following the Second World War that was manifested in the 1951 convention and its protocol is somewhat contradicted. To put it most politely, is under immense strain. The international system of protection for refugees is coming under pressure on a number of fronts. As I mentioned, the numbers are shocking and challenging in terms of the human suffering involved, but they are not unmanageable. Indeed, 80% of refugees are hosted in countries, neighbouring their countries of origin, often without much fanfare or acknowledgement. Refugees, when asked, actually always up near the top choices, they would love to return home. And therefore, you have a whole series of strategy choices then in relation to make as to what is transitional and what is transitional for return and transitional for adaptation and transitional for movement. However, what I believe is more worrying is the increasing lack of international solidarity, both with refugees themselves and those with communities and countries that host them. This is most apparent by how in response to the relatively small number of refugees reaching our borders has brought forth a type of narrative about the other that we in the humanitarian tradition had hoped was assigned to the chronicles of the past. Countries whose citizens have often benefited from international asylum and migratory flows are reneging on their commitments with the aim of discouraging or inhibiting refugees from seeking the international protection to which they are entitled under the 1951 Convention and Protocol. Pope Francis' injunction that to all of this we must not remain mute in what he called a culture of indifference is one that I so strongly support. In his briefing to the United Nations Security Council last April, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, spoke of the growing hostility towards people on the move. Reflecting on his over 35-year career, he remarked, I have never seen such toxicity, such poison in the language of politics, in the media, in social media, and even in everyday discussions and conversations around this issue. This toxicity often focuses sadly, tragically on refugees, migrants and foreigners. That should be of concern to us all. 
And that is the great problem that we have, that we have sunk to this level, or that we have tolerated the sinking of those in authority to use language like this. I fully agree with Filippo Grandi's comments. Regrettably, we are losing, be it through a consciousness rendered mute, broken, made weary, alienated, anomic, and at times perhaps obsessed with the very struggle for survival in a world that uses one's life but does not respect it, that what is lost is one of the most fundamental tenets of our humanity, giving help to those in need. It may be the case that refugees turn to their fellow global citizens for protection and shelter with the hope of a better future and increased opportunities for themselves and their families. There's a bit of a gloss in this, I feel, however. The truth is that many are seeking to escape from circumstances where hope has been lost. It isn't an easy decision to leave that with which you have been intimate, the place that you called home. And many, like our ancestors in their day, have undertaken arduous journeys and on arrival have to grapple with a foreign language, a different climate, a new set of social and cultural customs. They desire nothing more than to contribute fully in their adopted homes. Yet for many, after reaching safety, they are subjected to prejudice and, above all, stereotyping, born of ignorance and fear, with the new capacities for communication, abused by carrying that ignorance and fear. When such prejudice is driven by political populism and lazy opportunism, it is all the more despicable and deplorable. However, rising inequality is undoubtedly a factor in this increased hostility. Europe, for example, for many decades, a leader in championing the rights of refugees, and since 2008, it has processed over 6 million asylum applications now confronted by the rise of populist political ideologies, of what is not a nationalism, but a neo-nationalism, for it does not speak of any emancipatory tendency towards freedom. It speaks really, what is based, a calling up and exploiting of fear, division and exclusion, with the excluded often being those who by their marginalization have become abandoned to become the prey of xenophobes and racists. And while this presents a major threat to European solidarity, it is also a challenge, an invitation to all of us to stand our ground against such tendencies. As High Commissioner Grandi said recently, only if Europe is strong and united will Europeans be able to deal with refugee and migration issues in a principled, practical, ethical and effective manner. In Ireland, we may have to date been spared the worst of the populism and hatred seen elsewhere, but we are not immune from it. With that attitude which targets and scapegoats minorities, including refugees and migrants. Political leaders have, in general in Ireland, behaved in a responsible and ethical way. Nonetheless, I believe we must remain constantly vigilant to the threat of these menaces and the ease with which such toxicity can lodge itself through social media, for example. As President of Ireland, I have offered an apology on behalf of the people of Ireland when there had been incidents of callous and unacceptable behaviour directed at refugees. I believe that we cannot and must not remain silent in the face of such attacks on refugees and migrants. And thus Ireland will continue to stand with refugees both at home and abroad. We are all on our shared vulnerable planet challenged to give authentic meaning to, to what we mean by those concepts in all the religions of the world, hospitality and solidarity. In 1998, Ireland was one of the first countries in Europe to establish a resettlement programme between 2000 and 2016. Almost 2,000 refugees from 30 nationalities have settled in Ireland. More recently, in response to the war in Syria, Ireland has agreed to welcome 4,000 refugees under its resettlement and relocation programme. Ireland has developed a community sponsorship programme from which so much new work has to be done, a model which allows communities to come together and offer to host refugees 
arriving to be resettled in Ireland. And this is a model, as I said, that needs more further work, that has to be resourced and developed to be the receiving, hospitable, migrant and community adapting institution it is called upon to be. We need to continually review and improve on our process and our policies. On the international level, Ireland was proud to co-facilitate with Jordan the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants, adopted unanimously by United Nations member states. It represented an acknowledgement by the international community that there is a pressing need for a comprehensive approach to human mobility and that protection of refugees is a shared international responsibility requiring enhanced global cooperation on migration. The New York Declaration laid the groundwork for the development of the Global Compacts on Migration and Refugees, subsequently adopted by the international community. Ireland will also continue to strongly support the work of UNHCR and will continue to, it, it, to, to offer 16.5 million to the organisation in 2019. The United Nations has the potential to play a transformative role in tackling these issues. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development recognises for the first time the contribution of migrants to sustainable development. Some 11 of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals contain targets and indicators that are relevant to migration or mobility. The agenda's core principle is to leave no one behind, including migrants. And let me now say as a sociologist and someone who writes occasionally about economics, that this phrase to leave no one behind needs very serious revision. Just, I simply put it directly, does this mean inviting those who are not yet participants in the paradigm that is failing to become part of it? Or is it an invitation to them to become part of the new paradigm? Leaving no one behind in a society that has made the planet to the edge of a precipice with overconsumption and irresponsibility. It is a phrase I offer, you know, that I see and I use it because it is in the discourse, but to make it critical, leaving no one behind. I spoke at New York University about how you can in fact abuse metrics in relation to global poverty by saying that because you use them with this free, we're winning the war against global poverty. We are not, but we are abusing metrics to suggest that we are. Public now, I now come, if you like, this is a good transition to maybe the toughest point of what I have to say. Public intellectuals and academics have a crucial role to play, I believe, in giving support and weight as we wrestle with humanitarian crisis. They can play a critical role in altering the discourse on humanitarian crisis, a discourse that has far too frequently become soured by a hateful oppositional rhetoric. Public intellectuals are uniquely placed to reveal the structural resources that contribute to humanitarian crisis, that, as they would say in the old literature on migration, create the push. <coughs> I have already stated that it is hard to overstate the importance of universities as communities of learning, disputation, and personal and social development. However, the present day finds academics and other intellectuals in the public space highly challenged. Their very raison d'etre, I suggest, is contested. Some public intellectuals have been seduced by the reliance on corporate power. Other academics, I suggest, have drifted into a cosy consensus that accepts the failed paradigm of society and economy as the only model we have, or might have, of operating internationally. They continue working with curricula that fail to offer or seek to recover the possibility of alternative futures. Alternatives in the social sciences, for example, culture and philosophy. Universities are challenged in an urgent way by the questions that are now posed, questions that are after all existential, that are of the survival of the biosphere, of deepening inequality, of a resile to the language of hate, war and fear, and the very use of science and technology yet again 
in for warfare rather than in serving humanity. And one has to think about it as well. Those of us who a long, long time to look at it, what is taught in Economics 101 all over North America? How much of it is real political economy? Or how much moral content is in it? How much of it is game theory in relation to learning riddles that will prepare you for speculation in a further life? These moral questions are beyond ones that might be considered any narrow adjustment in the needs of a narrow hegemonic utility. There is a real concern now that the emphasis on funding from beyond the state has had a distorting effect on the career structure of young scholars in particular, so many of whom now constitute what is really a precariat in institutions struggling under the yoke of a neo-utilitarianism that is bad for scholarship, bad for society, and that has not merely failed, but has contradicted the principles of the United Nations Charter. And yet so many are drifting through indifference to a human disaster, unparalleled in its consequences. I believe public intellectuals have an ethical obligation as an educated elite to take a stand against the increasingly aggressive orthodoxies and discourse of the marketplace that have permeated all aspects of life, including within academia. Is it not as important to experience the development of the self with others and one's connection with and theirs to a shared citizenship in history as it is to become a suggested useful, individualized, consuming unit in a consuming culture? Universities, after all, function within a culture and how they negotiate that relationship, these balances, defines the ethos and output, and it is how they should be judged. The role of academics, and particularly those involved in the public sphere, it could be argued, is to seize moments and to have the courage to provide reaction, to be subversive of received thought assumptions and fallacies. According to the late Edward Said, an intellectual's mission in life is to advance human freedom and knowledge. This mission often means standing outside of society and its institutions and actively disturbing the status quo. And isn't it interesting how the cultural sphere does this in so well in a way sometimes that the academy does not? Yet it also involves placing a strong emphasis on intellectual rigor and, if you like, and ideas while ensuring that governing authorities and in international intermediary organizations are well resourced. As Immanuel Kant put it, thought, thoughts without content are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. As I say this, I realize again the precarity of those young and not so young scholars who without security, tenure or protection are struggling to live within a system that far from realizing their intellectual and moral potential is a source of alienation, allowing a limited, distorted resonance with the joy and agony of life as it is lived. Academics all over the world should weep for the destruction of the concept of the university that has occurred in so many places, which has led to little less than the degradation of learning. Issues relating to the role of the public intellectual have an acute meaning in the context of the United Nations, where I have been last week, and particularly for multilateralism, which is so much under attack just now. The United Nations, which faces ongoing questions regarding its representation, who should hold power within the United UN, its mandate, what should be the UN's responsibilities, and its effectiveness, how should the UN be organised and run? Multilateralism is at a crossroads. There are, I believe, at least three critical elements to the role of public intellectualism, both rational and intuitive. Knowledge, ability, and moral courage. And that includes the willingness to awaken society for a noble cause or purpose. In the words of Albert Einstein, the world is a dangerous place not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. The fundamental purpose of the United Nations is surely 
all must agree to ensure that the world does not look on and do nothing. In times of the threatening rhetoric of war, humanitarian crisis, human rights violations, and to ensure that peace so hard won is lasting and stable. And above all, that our words and climate change are turned into action. We are, however, I repeat, living in a time when the very purpose of the UN is being questioned. As an institution, it is being undermined overtly and covertly. The wider context in which the UN has to function is one of a trade-driven globalization that eschews any ethical responsibility, that has seriously narrowed the normative in diplomacy, that sustains a hegemonic single model of connection between economy and society, with development then in turn being used as a conduit for the disseminated singularity of such a connection. A notion that suggests that repeating the mistakes of the North will be sufficient for the future of the more populous South. Our need of a new ethically informed paradigm is acute. Our survival, any meaningful response to our interacting crises requires it. I have been arguing for the exit from a failing paradigm, for a scholarship that facilitates a new paradigm of connection of ecology, economy and society, and indeed ethics. It is not simply a matter of putting an ecological or social gloss on what we have. We have to strive for a new symmetry between ecology, economy, society, one that respects diversity in all its forms, while sharing a consciousness of what we must do together cooperatively. I remember those conversations in Central America 40 years ago, and Javier Gorostiaga and I speaking about a civilization of sufficiency and of the distinction which you must all recognize in your own life. Or when does one make the transition from sufficiency to insatiability? It is insatiability that has been the motor power that has driven us to the point of the precipice. I believe that quality of life cannot be measured simply in terms of consumption of resources, accumulation and consumption. Instead, we must consider our relationship to our resonance with the world, not as we would wish to use or indeed abuse it, but ask how we are taken into that world, how it takes us in and with what joy or pain. In brilliant recent work, Professor Hartman Rosa puts it like this, from the act of breathing to the adoption of culturally distinct worldviews, all the great crises of modern society, ecological, democratic, psychological, can be understood and analysed in terms of resonance and our broken relationship with the world around us. Loss of harmony. Rosa's book, Resonance, is an impressive contribution to contemporary social theory, presenting as it does an alternative view of modernity, as the history of a catastrophe of resonance. There is an increasing recognition, too, in cross-disciplinary work of the importance of resonance, and there is a growing body of evidence that suggests its importance for deep human fulfillment. Professor Hartmut Rose's book is at once a reflection of loss and of efforts towards belonging, as I would put it, having a resonance for and with the world. One can also see how such an approach could reconcile cultural work and the better insights of economic and social studies. I've elaborated on this concept because I believe that this has relevance to humanitarianism and particularly as to the quality of our collective response to, as peoples to migration. I believe this catastrophe of resonance is helpful in seeking to understand the growing narcissism, aggressive individualism, emphasis on insatiable consumption and wealth accumulation, and acceptance of yawning and deepening inequality. Reading the popular press, one can see too how migration and its consequences is perceived by some as an unwelcome interruption in the lives of some passive consumers, busy about, as Sigmund Bauman put it, being consumed in their consumption. As a young university teacher appointed at the end of the 1960s, I had myself hopes of the emancipatory power of humanistic social science. 
We all struggled against the colonization that was modernization theory. And we wrestled as well with the Washington Consensus. But I could not have foreseen the influence of the second coming of the, th of the ideas of theorists such as Friedrich von Hayek or the influence they would have, not only on theory, but on public policies that would be privileged in the United Kingdom, the United States and elsewhere in the 80s and 90s. And I saw those views from the Graduate School of Chicago moved to, uh, to, to Chile to implement an agenda uh, uh, of imposed market theory and austerity. I, these were offered not as policies chosen, among competing options, the outcome of any inclusive, contested, democratic public discourse, but as a single hegemonic version of the connection between markets, economy, and society, itself sold to a public as a kind of individualistic natural law, as it were, and delivered with an authoritarianism to match, as basic needs were adjusted to macrofiscal abstractions and fiction. Decades of Keynesianism have given way to decades influenced by such theories as those of Friedrich van Hayek and Milton Friedman, given way to unrestrained, unregulated market dominance and a communications order with a discourse that privileges aggressive individualism. All language, too, could be stolen. I think, for example, of that wonderful Canadian philosopher who wrote Man's Search for Authenticity. And authenticity became distorted into being constructed as if you like narcissism when you cared for nothing. Where authenticity, as it was used by Taylor originally, was one which was achieving fulfillment through others of the self. A prevailing largely uncontested paradigm has emerged and gained hegemony. That paradigm has had consequences for all institutions, including universities and indeed the United Nations. It is a paradigm that makes assumptions regarding the connection between scholarship, politics, economy, and society. Indeed, the interrelationship of societies. In the sense of Foucault, I see it as a kind of colonization, imprisonment taken into oneself, mind, and sensibility. It has gained strength and encouraged an individualism without social responsibility, within and beyond borders. It not only asserts a rationality for markets, but in policy terms has delivered laissez-faire markets without regulation. Its colonization of language I have referred to, distortion of concepts, even emancipatory ones, has assisted in the concept of freedom, for example, being redefined in a reductionist manner as market freedom. Consequently, the public word must now become, as it was before in human history, a space of contestation, a space that sets that which is democratic in tension with that which is unaccountable. And as we live through this period, seeking an exit from extreme individualism, a period where the concept of society itself has been questioned and redefined narrowly and pejoratively, when the public spaces in so many Western countries the human body itself has been commodified. And it is when as calculating rational choice maximizers rather than as citizens that we have been invited to view our neighbors. We must come together, merging consciousness of ecology, human need, dignity, respect for sources of truth and, and solidarity, reason both from reasoned and revealed sources. We must combine cooperation for the recovery of the public world, informed by the music of the heart as much as by the partial suggestions of ratio. That is what ancient systems from distant places are inviting us to do. Our existence, then, in the paradigm from which we must seek exit is assumed to be, is defined as competing individual actors, at times neurotic in our insatiable anxieties for consumption. Bauman, whom I've mentioned already in his book, Consuming Life, speaks of consumers become the promoters of the commodities they consume. In essence, therefore, consumers become a commodified, commodified entity in their presentation of themselves. The value 
of humans is debased us and reduced to their economic worth. I make this point because behind these transitions lies an intellectual collusion that unfortunately masks a rationalization. Standing in support of under-regulated markets, of unaccountable, often speculative capital flows, are scholars who frequently invoke the legitimation provided by a university, which itself at times is put under pressure to demonstrate its utility as the seat of the single hegemonic model of political economy that prevails. All of this, as I come to conclusion, can change. Universities can lead a new paradigm of engagement with the world, contribute meaningfully to the discourse on the pressing challenges of the day, be it the crisis of democracy, the ecological crisis, or the humanitarian crisis. This paradigm to come to lodge as alternative in the different forms necessitates a dialogue that can move out from specialist and esoteric jargon to a broad, vibrant public space that thus retains for the university a capacity to be different, to be relevant once more, to be the source of critical ideas, language, and tropes which can resist the diktats of the marketplace that demand a narrow utility. And it requires a process of healing with creative cultural expression being made possible in public places and having access to the creativity of the self in interaction with others. All of these issues are about how we look at each other and either avert our gaze or celebrate our vulnerabilities, joy and anxieties in interdependency. We need a new, vibrant economic social literacy, one that can carry merged consciousnesses from ecological, social, economic, and gender activists. Will universities be allowed to do this? Will they seek the space, the capacity, the community of scholarship necessary to challenge such paradigms of the connection between economy, ecology, society, ethics, democratic discourse, and authoritarian position as have failed, or alternatively, will they drawing on their rich university tradition at its best, recover moments of disputation and discourse, seek to offer alternatives that propose a democratic, liberating, and sustaining future. I believe that a university is a response which is critically open to originality in theory and research, committed to humanistic values in teaching, has a great opportunity to make a global contribution of substance to the great challenges and crisis we face. That such a university can be and will be celebrated by future generations as the one that was the hub of original critical thought, a promoter of its application through new models of interconnection between science, technology, administration, and society. And this will facilitate a better connection between the sciences, humanities, and culture representing a paradigm shift away from the strict divisions that have sometimes impeded academics to realize their best work, and which has perhaps fueled the decline in interest in the public intellectual. As subjects are recast, unities can be restored, and we should consider Edward Said's suggestion that it is in the interstices between subjects that the most exciting ideas emerge. The change I advocate is about recovering the right to pose important questions, such as Immanuel Kant did through the development of his form of transcendental realism in his time. What might we know? What should we do? What may we hope? I think these are so important. There is a moral basis to, the, to those who are protesting, to those who would like a communitarian new beginning, but I believe that while fully recognizing the insufficient criticism historically by the left of the abuses of statism in relation to personal freedom, to walk away from the state, which itself has already been deeply ravaged by neoliberalism, would be a tragic error on the part of those who seek an emancipatory transformation in our societies. Of course, to rely entirely on advocacy directed at the state and to neglect the possibilities and promise of alternatives within civil society would also be a disastrous choice. But neither is necessary. As an academic and a writer, I too believe in the performative potential of language, words, 
And yes, ideas matter for bonding, bridge building, mapping out that common space of mind and democratic participation for both sides in conflict. Words are a great gift. They are all the power that some people and often some entire peoples and classes have. For some who live and struggle in an unequal world, in areas ravaged by war, natural disasters and political extremism, ideas and words are all they have at their disposal to express their common humanity, their aspirations for what is different, fair, equitable and above all emancipatory. They constitute what is for them the realm of hope as discovered and celebrated in cooperative community. In combining the tasks then of conscientization with a commitment to original thought and compassionate emancipatory scholarship and teaching, good intellectual ideas can help bridge the space to that utopia and its practice that we all as vulnerable inhabitants of our fragile planet need. I think that certainly, may I suggest that the performative, as historically represented in the march, the banners, the meetings, had a transformative capacity that is missing in isolated contexts of individuals sharing information in front of screens, but not collectively experiencing anything. Sharing is so important. I often think about this, and one of my unfinished poems about it is, the night is long and I awake and struggling to recall the beat of feet behind banners made holy on Saturdays, campaigning and so on. Edward Seed speaking to an audience in the University of Cape Town and invoking the example of John Henry Newman as an argument against specialization, suggested that the model for academic freedom should be the migrant or the traveler. And I'd like to finish with this. We should say it feels be free to discover and travel among other selves, other identities, other varieties of the human adventure. But most essentially in this joint discovery of self and other, it is the role of the academy to transform what might be conflict or contest or assertion into reconciliation, mutuality, recognition and creative interaction. That spirited defense of the idea of scholar, a searcher in pursuit of knowledge and freedom, allows for a contrasting of the sort of academic model of the professional who seeks to be king and potentate, as opposed to the traveler who is dependent not on power, but motion. Willing to enter different worlds, to use different idioms and understand a variety of disguises, masks and rhetorics. Above all, the migrant embraces novelty and eschews predetermined paths crossing over to the space of the other. This paradigm is the cultural idiom of academic freedom, but it is also the truly liberationist spirit of a genuine republic. And if as democratic republics, our nations are truly interested in protecting the republican ideals on which their constitutions are founded, incorporating founding principles which surely include solidarity, including solidarity beyond borders, then the ability to reach out to others in times of crisis is a key expression of a healthy, genuine republic that is abiding by its founding principles. I finish by humanitarianism itself. Humanitarianism, I suggest, is an active belief in the intrinsic value of human life. Through the actions of humans undertaking acts of benevolence and providing assistance to other humans, we achieve a form of human welfare betterment. It is in its origins a philosophical belief, but humanitarianism today is often used to describe the thinking and doctrines behind the emergency response to crises such as war and famine and natural disasters. A core tenet of humanitarianism is that people have equal dignity by virtue of their being human, based solely on need without discrimination among recipients. How much better it would be if the essential elements of what constitutes humanitarianism form the basis of the discourse, 
that prevails on the streets of the world and within the highest political echelons, rather than those subjects of humanitarian crisis being abandoned or indeed targeted as the prey of xenophobes and racists. And words do matter. I suggest, again, public intellectuals have a crucial role to play in their contribution to the humanitarian discourse broadly, and in particular the language and commentary relating to migration. We have seen in recent times the souring of language used by elected officials of governments, often those with nativist and populist tendencies with regard to the humanitarian crisis, using stereotypes. That debased discourse grounded as it is not only in irrational but contrived fear and ignorance, provides fertile ground for political extremism and an ideology of extreme individualism at best. And I think it has to be opposed with courage. I think that in the end, in many cases, we must realise there is just one other last point I want to make. The necessary requirements of intellectuals I spoke of earlier. But sometimes people suggest we are actually working on the problem. But I think, frankly, this alleged suggestion of the exclusive demands of time and effort, of clarity, will in fact, I think, be used as a mask. You have in the end to go out into the public world and take on the tasks and the challenge of communicating that which you have been, in fact, been the subject of your moral wrestling. I want to just thank you all very, very much. May I suggest that universities, if I have been critical, it is because I see that they have a key role as institutional citizens in fostering an enlightened and multifaceted debate about migration. And I congratulate you on providing a haven to international students in times of persecution and for scholars who have been forced to flee. And I do wish to say, I conclude with a message of hope. It would be easy to fall into the trap of pessimism and become disheartened when faced with the grand scale of what we face, especially in the current geopolitical trajectory. The concept of utopia is being recovered in intellectual work in so many, so many places. Work such as that of, 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 of Ruth Levitas. But let me only say, which is very, very important, Ernst Bloch suggested that utopianism not only involves a rejection of what is and what is useless and a hope for an alternative, but for a strategy for its implementation is central. And I think that that is what we must all do in our combined consciousnesses. Take the power and the transformative potential of that which is driving ecological issue, the response to ecological crisis, deepening inequality, economic crisis, loss of cohesion, and as well as that, the grave, grave need to remake the constitutions so that they are enabled to respond to the heart of the world rather than being trapped in producing what are, if you like, hopeless riddles of what is failing. So I wish you all and what you imagine for the future, may it be blessed in its inclusivity. Verbanach this mile week as us the Eastern von Leacht Father Shah. I thank you for having your patience in listening to this rather long lecture of mine, and I so wish you success in everything you do. And I urge you to activism, no matter what you can do. There is nothing that cannot be understood. There is nothing that cannot be communicated. And there is nothing that cannot be replaced. And it is all there to be gained. And there is great joy in all of that in communal celebration. Barbanak, many thanks. <laughs>